Thank you. It, it really is a privilege to be here. Unlike Irv, I'm not Lee's oldest friend. Uh, kind of happy about that. But I am uh, a very, very long-term uh, colleague. Uh, I first got to know uh, Lee real well uh, when he was uh, visiting as an advisor to a Howard Hughes Medical uh, Institute uh, program in Coconut Grove, probably in 1980. And uh, the two of us were runners. We went out for an eight or a 10 mile run in about 100 degree weather. And that last four miles coming back was a bonding experience that has never been broken. Uh, Lee, um, you know, I, I could spend my entire 30 minutes talking about my esteem for Lee, but simp simply put, I can, cannot name uh, a uh, biomedical research scientist in the last 40 years that has had a greater impact on a number of different fields uh, than Lee Hood. And uh, having gotten to know him a, a bit, and uh, uh, I'm very pleased to be his uh, kind of e East Coast colleague and thinking about uh, P4 Medicine, personalized healthcare. It's been a real thrill, and uh, being here with you is, uh, is very, very important to me. So over the next uh, 30 minutes, uh, Lee asked me to talk about where I thought healthcare was going in the future and to kind of open up the horizons in doing it. I chose to talk about where I think healthcare will be in 2028, uh, maybe specifically October. 12th to 13th, whatever the exact day is, 2028 when we're celebrating Lee's 90th birthday, okay? So that's what uh, I would like to be doing today. Now, <clears throat> uh, somebody, I guess Rod mentioned the best of times, the worst of times, uh, and I really do believe that that is true uh, in healthcare. So uh, what I'd like to talk about today is how we move from a reactive sporadic disease approach to healthcare, which still is what we are doing today, with even the most miraculous advantage, uh, advances uh, that we have heard about, uh, and they are very, very important. We still believe that we could move the approach to healthcare to a proactive, personalized, and ultimately consumer driven uh, healthcare system. Now, just a, just a bit of history. Clearly, science and technology is extremely important in moving how healthcare delivery occurs. And I, I would call where we are now is at the early stages of a second great transformation in healthcare. The first major transformation in healthcare occurred at the beginning of the 20th century. And that is when an aggregation of sciences led by uh, investigators such as Pasteur and Koch and Lister uh, and uh, in chemistry, uh, Ehrlich and Fisher and in Renkinology, uh, the Curies and Rankin, et cetera, et cetera. There was an aggregation of sciences which in the aggregate allowed medicine to move from a metaphysical uh, form and which was based on a humoral theory of disease, disease uh, being caused by an imbalance of metaphysical humors such as gold bile, black bile, et cetera, et cetera, where the therapies of the time were bloodletting and suction cupping, uh, uh, theories based on no science whatsoever. So uh, medicine, uh, after uh, waiting, it took it 20, 30 years until it caught up to this capability, which is interesting to think about. Uh, started uh, being based by the, the principle of the pathophysiology of disease. And I think all of us uh, who were trained as physician in the audience know it, that we were trained based on the pathophysiology of disease. That the role of the physician uh, in any complex disease, thinking about tuberculosis being caused by the tubercle bacillus, something as complex as tuberculosis being caused by the tubercle bacillus, our role as a physician is to find it and fix it. Despite the fact that any physician knows tuberculosis could vary from being a, a, an unappreciated disease to rapid death with miliary tu uh, tuberculosis and everything in between. So even as we were trained, it's not that simple. But you know, here we are now, and, and this is uh, I think what actually brought Lee and I together uh, maybe 2004, 2005. 
we were in another phase where an aggregation of new capabilities, science and technology capabilities, from the multi-omics to the concepts of systems biology, which I think Lee has really been the strongest spokesperson uh, for, to the development of uh, mano, na micro nanoprocessing, digital technologies, and now artificial intelligence, we are in the frontiers of a whole new way of looking at not only taking care of diagnosing and treating disease, but improving health and enhancing well-being. And that's what is so exciting. And, and to clarify the striking difference of where we are moving from to where we are going, where we have been from the early uh, 2000, uh, 1900s until now, and still in medical schools uh, being uh, pretty much up to the moment, physicians being trained as reductionists in understanding human disease. And I want to make it clear, <clears throat> there's nothing wrong with that. We need reductionism, but that is, that is not the answer. Reductionism, it says, when a patient comes to you, whatever complex problem they have, find the single most important uh, cause, find it and fix it. What we now know very clearly is that uh, any human condition, including any disease, is a combination basically of two things. Their baseline risk and what they have been exposed to over their lifetime. And this could lead to improving their health and well-being or depending on their susceptibilities and exposures to the development of disease, which initially may be reversible uh, and go to irreversibility. The main point I want to make today is getting to basics. Can we envision a healthcare delivery system that is designed to understand and take advantage of this, these basic facts? And that's what I want to talk about today. So a, a new term uh, that I've heard and initially sounds hokey, but I encourage you uh, not to say, oh, another ohm, uh, to really really uh, think about this a little because it really is quite meaningful that uh, this is the most simple-minded uh, view uh, which leads to a lot of complexity that one's genome plus their exposome over time leads to health and disease. And what do I mean by exposome? Exposome are all environmental exposures including diet, lifestyle, psychosocial which you obviously believe very strongly in uh, as well as endogenous sources, including one's microbiome uh, and anything one affecting uh, one's internal biology leads to their current state of health and predicts their future state of health. So when I started getting uh, interested in this while I was Chancellor for Health Affairs at Duke uh, in the late 1990s, and, and it was obvious that uh, these capabilities were are going to be coming online and, and overlooking a big healthcare system and seeing how well we were treating episodes of disease, but sending people home almost as sick as they were before they had their episode. And what is that all about? We could do better. I started thinking about how we could redesign a healthcare system based on these fundamental principles. So uh, I came up with this uh, idea in trying to explain this concept to somebody who wasn't a physician, that the development of any chronic disease is a function of one's uh, basic inheritance plus what they're exposed to over time. And that the longer one takes to intervene, if this is the development of the disease, the greater cost there is in reversing it and the, the uh, decreased likelihood there is of being reversible. This kind of simple-minded uh, fact. But what was so ironic, and to a degree it still is, is that the major focus of the healthcare system in the United States today is far to the right of this curve, treating disease when it is well established. And it became apparent to me that if we just change the mindset of the physician to move from your chief complaint, you know, what is, what is wrong with this patient coming to see me because they are sick, to have them start thinking, what is the earliest clinical detection? 
look how far we could move that arrow. But with all the new capabilities of determining the development of disease before it occurs with molecular detection, we could move it way to the left. And then, if we could truly understand one's baseline risk, we, that may not be and won't be determinant necessarily of them developing a disease, but gives us uh, a understanding of an individual's risk. Just thinking about that, you just say, wow, you know, that gets pretty damn exciting. That's an interesting way to think about healthcare. And we started thinking about that. Uh, and the more we thought about it, we thought that, gee, this, as a model, this really works as developing different approaches to healthcare. So while an individual is seemingly healthy, we could be thinking about, well, let's quantify their baseline risks and let's understand for them uh, what are the approaches that maximize their health and well-being, uh, being appreciative of this individual's risks and, and how great they are if we could quantify them. We would have the opportunity to monitor progression uh, by looking at various biomarkers. If a disease developed, we would use every strategy, including what Irv talked about, such exciting strategies to treat diseases that have emerged. So we could be thinking about the impact of this way of thinking in health enhancement, disease prevention, and disease management. It, it tends to, to hold up. But another factor that is extremely important, and again, this is all cartoon made up, but, but it does seem to, to work. So if you think about any inflection curve for any disease, and for a moment, moment think about cardiovascular disease, and let's say the red inflection curve may be the average development of cardiovascular disease. But based on the individual's behavior, their nutrition, uh, substance, uh, risk exposure, exercise, stress, psychosocial environment, depending on what they do, what they're exposed to, the development of the disease may occur much more quickly. And an uh, individual can have a heart attack in their 40s. On the other hand, somebody with a susceptibility to cardiovascular disease doing all the right things and potentially taking a statin uh, might uh, move the, the curve all the way to the right so it's irrelevant. They live to 105 and, and die of frailty. Uh, so um, this becomes very important in terms of thinking about the development of a healthcare system. What I'd like to do now is pause for a moment and not shut off the slides. How in the world did I do that? Okay. Um, There's a very powerful little tool here. I'll try to be more careful. So I'd like to uh, then, then say, uh, move from this to say, where, where are we now? Where we are now, uh, again, the best of times and the worst of times. In terms of the best of times, the ability to develop new capabilities of treating disease uh, and emerging uh, capabilities has never been better. But if you look at it from the perspective of the individual, the individual uh, having access to health care, most health care is delivered by traditional services. Uh, this is a three point, roughly $3.5 trillion business. Uh, out of that business, most of the money uh, really is in specialty care, hospital care, and uh, emergency care. So there is a tremendous density of healthcare resources focused on what we might call sick care. Uh, and um, uh, it, it's done reasonably well. But you know, what I could tell you as a Chancellor Emeritus at Duke, uh, people say, what is that job? What does it entail? Well, what it entails for me is having people call me on the phone and say, I have this problem or that problem. What do I do about it? Where do I go? I want to go to Duke. Who do I talk to? And it really takes that hand-holding to navigate this system because it's so damn complex. Uh, so people are generally confused. Now, you know, we know we have a, a, a very forward-looking healthcare here, system here that is trying to do some, something about it, but very few are. 
navigating that system. But if you think about all the other capabilities, now with digital capabilities and uh, uh, an awful no lot of health and wellness programs and community resources, they're available, but the consumer is very confused. There are new entrants, and this is very exciting. Uh, in addition to the major providers of healthcare, which would be the integrated delivery systems, uh, we now have new players. Uh, Google is uh, investing a tremendous amount of money uh, in many areas of healthcare, uh, including artificial intelligence. And as you know, Duke and Stanford are collaborating in a, in a, uh, in a study. Uh, with Verily, we're, we're sequencing, whole genome sequencing of 10,000 people, giving them every device in the world get, that could measure everything and trying to call, figure out what causes what. But, so we have a whole new uh, series of entrants that are trying to disrupt the system. Uh, with Google and Apple, IBM, Walgreens, CVS, uh, Fitbit, all kinds of new codes, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so we know that the system is, uh, is very likely to be disrupted. A $3.5 trillion system, highly inefficient, very little satisfaction on the part of the consumer or the payer, uh, amazing opportunity. It will be disrupted, but the question is how? Now, I'd like to uh, use the remainder of my time talking about where I think healthcare is going and how we could try to envision where it's going and maybe try to nudge it in going in a better uh, direction. And getting back to, ba to basic principles, you know, what are the underpinning capabilities that allow the development of an approach to healthcare? Very simply put, Technologies. By technologies, I don't mean simply technical uh, instruments or, or drugs. I'm thinking about all the capabilities that we could bring to bear about understanding uh, how one enhances health and well-being, as well as all the tools that are necessary to deliver healthcare that way. So that, that is one factor. I'll talk about that uh, in, in a moment in terms of all the new things that we're capable of doing. But then it's the delivery system itself. You know, so what is the approach to care? Is the approach to care primarily uh, an individual waiting till they get sick, uh, and if they get sick, uh, come into the healthcare system, and is it a primary care uh, physician or urgent care or whatever? How, how is healthcare delivered? And, and today, uh, I would say the delivery mechanism is primarily the way it's supposed to work, the patient sees a, uh, uh, sees a primary care physician, primary care physician uh, does an evaluation, distributes within the delivery system where the patient needs to go. So the, that, that's basically the current approach if it were able to work. But there are other approaches, and we could talk about that, and the personalized healthcare approach is another approach. And then the last and the most overlooked and maybe the most important part of the entire system is the individual. What the individual does, what they care about. And quite frankly, most people don't spend hardly any amount of time thinking about their health. It's something that's taken for granted unless things go wrong. Individuals that have something go wrong, being involved still now in overseeing uh, the uh, treatment of many, many people with type 2 diabetes through some of the programs that we're doing. The biggest problem that we have with even the most innovative, innovative approaches to care is having people say, yeah, I buy in. You know, I'm willing to do the things that need to be done to get, to get me better. So if you uh, think about all the advances that we may ever bring to bear in healthcare and what kind of difference they would make, just be a little bit skeptical by saying, well, let's think about uh, type 2 diabetes or pre-diabetes. We're able to do so much with this disease, really. I'm not sure how many more advances we need. What we really need is for people to say, okay, I'm going to change my diet and exercise and take my medication, and it's very, very hard to do. So we need to be realistic. While all of us love the excitement 
of, the, of new advances in science and technology, if we're thinking about healthcare delivery, we cannot overlook the attention that needs to be paid to getting people to appreciate more what they want their health for and to have them buy into it. And, and I think that this is one of the big parts of the solution. Okay, so now the exciting part. You know, what, what has changed in healthcare even since, Lee, when you and I started getting very excited in 2005? The, the areas which I did not anticipate, you, you probably did, but I did not anticipate the importance of, let's say, uh, data, massive data in the cloud, artificial intelligence, and the abil ability to learn from massive amounts of information. But the, the development of really good predictive algorithms, these are still in the infancy, but with all of the efforts that are ongoing to look at many people, whole genome sequencing, measuring everything they can about them, comprehensively putting it together, analyzing and seeing what makes the difference. Uh, these are very exciting. Artificial intelligence. Uh, the Brain Initiative, uh, I'll, I'll say at the very end, uh, as I knew I was preparing for this talk, I contacted about 15 of, I thought, the most important people in thinking about healthcare of the future, and I asked each of them to give me five things that they thought were going to be the main drivers. So this is the aggregate of many people. Gil is in the audience. He was one of them. Uh, but uh, Francis Collins said the brain initiative. Don't overlook the brain initiative. It's going to give us tremendous insight in the human brain. Uh, precision diagnostics, many, uh, everybody understands digital technologies. The development of robotics and avatars and augmented reality and the ability to bring healthcare out to the individual. 3D printing to be able uh, to make uh, virtually any uh, body part or any organ, any tissue. Uh, and, and we heard a little bit today from Irv Weissman, the whole field of immunoregulation. Gene editing, which is already uh, beginning, uh, and cell therapies, uh, also for cancer and other things. Very, very exciting. So uh, I believe we have the technologies we need to transform healthcare in a very positive way. But what about the delivery? You know, here I just want to get to basics. The way physicians are still trained. Uh, is based on disease care, where when you go to see a physician, uh, if it isn't for your annual physical, which generally nowadays are worthless, uh, but a uh, physician will generally say, what brought you here to see me? Uh, they are looking for your chief complaint. And they do this beautiful root cause analysis of failure to determine your chief complaint and to reverse it. It really is a beautiful thing to see. We cannot stop doing this. Uh, when it needs to be done. But the model that we came up and that we've been uh, developing and, and working in close collaboration with the Veterans Hospital Administration is an approach to care that we think is a general approach to care, including health and well-being, where we start with a current assessment of the individual's health using all the best tools to try to understand it. And then with any health risk assessment tools that are relevant and available, we'll try to anticipate that individual's risks going forward. We spent a lot of time trying to enhance that patient's engagement. We do things including mindful, mindfulness meditation to get individuals at the very early part of their, event, their engagement with us to be thinking about what is the most important things that they want their health for. Why do they want their health? And a very common answer is, so I could play with my grandchildren every other Sunday and get down on the rug with them and be able to stand back up. And we say, that's a good thing, and, and we'll try to work with you on that. We develop specific wellness and therapeutic goals and a plan, a specific plan with what we call SMART goals, specific, measurable, actionable, et cetera, et cetera and then uh, determine what is it we're going to track success or not, and we coordinate care. And we believe there may be other models, but we, there are a lot of foundational principles that we think will be incorporated by any model of proactive uh, health care delivery. And then, you know, what is getting, you know, we, we think really exciting. Uh, Irv and I were talking about this a little bit last night. 
and that is being able to understand the individual, who they are, and what their needs are. Uh, and we're being able to do this much more systematically with a lot more capability and, uh, uh, and, and precision in knowing that individual. And I'll just say uh, genomics. We're, we're not there yet, but we are getting there. And we're going to get there uh, probably more quickly than uh, many people think. Uh, understanding the microbiome. We just had a visit from Jeff Gordon a couple of weeks ago. So exciting as to, uh, at least roughly speaking, uh, what one could learn from an individual's microbiome. Uh, here, this is a whole new area, uh, what people are exposed to. Understanding the main uh, exposure drivers, what they are and can they be measured in an individual. Uh, and that, that, that's an important area to be thinking about because ultimately we, we need to measure it in the individual. Uh, their behaviors, what are the behaviors that really matter, uh, the clinical tests that we do, and then uh, a lot of uh, massive data, participant uh, contributed di uh, data and social networks, but ultimately try to find out for that individual what makes the most sense. So this is a very exciting approach. Now here, you know, just bear with me for a while uh, because I think this is really where I think the field is going. Rod, you and I were talking briefly about this and um, uh, I don't know when it'll be, but Lee, we're back here in 2028, mark my word, I'll stand on this one. And that is, this is what we try to do. When we do the patient's evaluation, we can't do most of these things, genome, exposome, um, they're still in their infancy, but as soon as we can, we'll do this. Current health status, health risk assessment, we learn as much about the individual as we can. Now, what is going to be happening very soon and happening already, all of that data will be digitalized and go into the individual's data hub. With really good advanced uh, electronic medical records, uh, it can be occurring already. This data hub can then be queried against aggregated patient libraries, massive amounts of data, and using risk models based on these data over time, learning what matters and doesn't matter, so that that can then inform that individual's risk. Right now, most of the risk assessment that we're doing is based on the, clinicals, the clinician's knowledge and clinical uh, tests. But we are moving rapidly with massive data in the cloud, more and more aggregation of data to refine that and use risk models. That will then be used to develop the individual's personal health plan. That personal health plan then will be followed by the individual over time. So you have more outcome data, uh, what worked, what didn't work, which will then go into this vast uh, aggregated patient data, data library, and then uh, inform that individual's plan over time, and then continually update this cycle. But the main prediction that I want to make, and hopefully many of us in this audience can make it happen, is to start moving from the chief complaint, single-minded approach to healthcare to the fact that there is a dynamic individual database that will be in the hands of the consumer, of the individual, with a navigator, whatever that is, with, with some organizing principle to allow them to access healthcare in different ways that will then inform uh, their healthcare delivery. And that's my big prediction. We're going to move there. I think within 10 years. And then if you look at the, this inflection curve uh, and you think about the individual anywhere with their healthcare needs, whether it be health enhancement, prevention, or disease management, they have access to what they need uh, for that system. And I'll, I'll end, I'll probably skip one slide. So we are doing this. Uh, we're doing this uh, at Duke. We're doing it with feder federally qualified health systems, uh, health centers and we're doing it with the VA. The VA has declared that every veteran will get personalized, proactive, patient-driven care. I was with the secretary, uh, Robert Wilkie, two, yesterday or two days ago. You lose time when you come out here to Seattle. I think it was two days ago. And he said he is committed 
to this approach. We'll see. It's very, very complicated. Uh, but uh, this is the approach that we do. It mirrors everything I discussed in the inflection curve. Irv Weissman and others, you could apply this to disease care and the kind of things that you're doing fit beautifully in this kind of decision tree uh, that we would have, let's say, for treating cancer. Uh, and uh, we believe that this works as well. It's being used in U.S. oncology. So I predict uh, when we get back together again, we will have a much happier consumer of health care. They will have their personal data hub and a personal health plan. It may be in their smartphone. They will interact uh, through the cloud, and there will be the smartest in this audience will figure out who that crystallizing navigator is going to be and how that's going to relate them to traditional services. Uh, and I think we have those visionaries uh, in the audience today, as well as allow people to uh, relate to wellness and community uh, programs. Just to name drop a moment, about six or seven years ago, I happened to be with Jeff Bezos, and he was talking about how their apps were going to allow somebody to drive in their car and have a signal saying, hey, you need a new pair of pants, and here is a place where you could get them on sale exactly your size, and they could drive in and, and get their pants. And I said, that's terrific, Jeff, but why don't you do it with a health plan? Uh, and I think he never asked me again, but he's probably doing it and will make another trillion dollars. Uh, but I think uh, that it would be a good thing to be thinking about what is the aggregation principle that allows this to happen? So uh, let me end by saying, uh, 2028, I almost guarantee it, healthcare will be more personalized, it'll be far more precise, it'll be far more participatory, people will be involved in their care with or without a physician, there'll be a lot more crowdsourcing, it'll be wherever, uh, we no longer need to have uh, individuals come to a physical location except for uh, specific reasons. It could be uh, any time, uh, and that all of this will roll up uh, to population health as well. And that, let me end by uh, saying by Machiavelli, uh, all of us in the room know this, uh, that whenever you're trying to start a revolution or do something new, uh, you never get uh, support from anybody who's already benefiting from the system as it exists. As a matter of fact, they want to hold you down. And most people don't have a clue what you're doing, so they're not there to support you. So it sometimes could be very lonely. But I'm also happy uh, to uh, say what Charles Darwin said, uh, in that it is not the strongest of the, speci uh, of the species that survives, including massive uh, health care providers that are asleep at the switch. Uh, it's the one that's most responsive to change. And I'd like to thank, uh, these are the individuals that contributed uh, one way or another uh, to some of my thinking. I'd like to thank them all, uh, but mainly thank you, Lee, uh, for being here 80 years and everything that you're doing, and I'll look forward to the next 10 uh, and continuing to collaborate with you. Thank you very much. <laughs>